Welcome to K-Drama School. I'm your host, Grace Jung, and class is now in session. If you're in New Hampshire, my short film JNS Auto is going to be playing at the New Hampshire Film Festival, which is currently celebrating its 20th year anniversary. And you can see that on October 9th, Sunday at 2.20 p.m. Eastern Time at the Lounge Theater. So if you're in New Hampshire or if you're around New Hampshire, please go and support the festival, which has amazing, amazing films in its lineup. And please go see my movie, which is starting to make its final rounds in the festival circuit. And for those of you who have seen my movie, thank you so much for your kind support. I have one more show date announcement. I am going to be performing at the Hollywood Improv on October 16th, Sunday at 7 p.m. in the lab. So please go and see the show. I am headlining in this showcase and the lineup features many hilarious comedians who have all been on my podcast. So we have Killian McCassie, Wendy Wilkins, Glenn Bolton, uh, Viet Wen, and uh, Kimberly Clark. Again, that's October 16th, Sunday, 7 p.m. at the Hollywood Improv in the Lab, which I will be headlining as part of the Grace Jung and Friends show. And tickets are available on gracejungcomedy.com. So please check it out. Today I'm going to be talking about the show Run On, which is a 2021 show currently on Netflix. I believe it came out from JTBC. It is not a show that I would call binge-worthy. Um, maybe some of you might disagree with me, but this show, which came out February of last year, took me this long to finish. And I, yeah, I just... I don't know, it's not a show that I am connected to uh, from the heart, so to speak. I started and stopped the show about a dozen times, but uh, there are some aspects of the show that I appreciate, which is why I want to discuss it. I know that a lot of people love the actor uh, Im Shiwan, and I, I also think that he's a decent actor, but I just don't think Im Shiwan is a good leading man in a romantic comedy. That's just, that's just my opinion, you know, and people have different tastes when it comes to men and, you know, their appeal, right? I mean, you know, don't let me yuck your yum is my, my point, but I just don't find him uh, to be a attractive leading man. He was really good in Mis Heng because he was playing this pariah, right? This weirdo pariah, this like outcast who doesn't fit into this white collar workspace but in run on Im Shiwan is playing the son of a wealthy politician and a very famous actress and he is himself a star athlete um i don't know he just he can't pull off the silver spoon kid uh role very well in my opinion and um i just i didn't really see a lot of good chemistry between Im Shiwan and Shin Se-kyung either i guess that was my issue. So for a romantic comedy, that's what you need. You need chemistry between the two leading actors, but this just didn't have that at all. Just zero, none. I did see Im Shiwan in a film called Emergency Declaration, where he plays a psychopathic killer, and he killed it as that role. I thought Im Shiwan did brilliantly in that role. So I think Im Shiwan is better off playing harder roles. I think he should really uh, pursue more daring roles like that, like a killer or a psychopath or even a cop. I'd like to see Im Shiwan play a cop or a detective, but he's really, he's really good at playing like a weirdo type. So yeah, he's not really a leading man in my opinion. Actress Shin Se-kyung is somebody I happen to like a lot. I think her acting skills improve with each new project that she takes on. And Shin Se-kyung has been in the show business since her youth, you know, since she was a young kid. But um, there was always something about her that seemed disconnected 
when she's performing on screen. And I don't know if that was her acting ability and its, and its incompetence, or I don't know if it's because of the roles that were written for her, which were almost always these passive women. But in this show, in Run On, Shin Se Young's character is very connected. I mean, she seems very connected to her emotions and her delivery of that is very convincing. And so I found Shin Se Young's performance in Run On very refreshing. And I appreciated that. Shin Se Young plays the character Mi Ju, who is a film uh, interpreter and translator. So interpretation is really used when uh, somebody is um, translating the spoken word. So if there's a filmmaker at a festival and he's speaking Korean, then Biju would uh, interpret that into English. All right, so that's interpretation, which often gets mis- uh, identified as translation. But no, translation is for the written word. But Shin Se Gyeong's character, Miju, does both, right? She's doing translation and interpretation. So subtitles that you see in movies, a character like Miju would be doing that work. And I found this character's struggle so relatable because I also used to work as an interpreter for filmmakers from South Korea at film festivals and I also worked as a translator. I thought the people that Miju gets into an argument with uh, were very um, telling of the kind of struggles that she is dealing with. So for instance, like Miju gets into an argument with the white male DP in one of the episodes, right? Like she's on set and she's supposed to be interpreting between the American crew and the Korean crew and th this white male DP on the film set loses his temper and he starts uh, bad-mouthing Koreans and South Korea while insisting that this film is very important for the Korean Americans living in North America. Uh, so very, very tone deaf, right, in this guy's, uh, from coming from this guy's uh, end. And Biju does lose her temper in the moment, but later on she is forced to apologize because Miju is a freelance interpreter and translator, whereas a DP is considered higher up in the food chain, higher up in the hierarchy of a film set, and therefore not as replaceable as a freelance interpreter. So this underappreciation of the interpreter and translator, right? Like that was very much uh, exhibited through this scene. We see Miju apologizing and groveling to more than one person on the show. For instance, like in the first episode, when Miju is being discriminated against and badmouthed publicly by a professor that she used to work with, um, he says like a lot of misogynistic things to her. Uh, she loses a gig for defending herself and standing up for herself, right? But of course, later on the next day, after losing that job, she goes to the hotel room to negotiate and apologize for her behavior, right? So it really shows the freelancer's plight and the plight of a person who, who does the sort of work that goes just constantly overlooked. And it's not seen as relevant or necessary, but think about you guys all watching shows on Netflix, Viki, other streaming channels. Somebody somewhere is doing that work of translating these subtitles, translating these dialogues, these lines, and then streamed online for you to watch these shows and understand what is going on. Somebody is doing that work. These kinds of people on the margins, working in the margins, really need to be appreciated more for what they do and they should be compensated more. My guest today is Mari Naomi. She is a visual artist and author. She has written many books that have been published and the publications go back to 20 years. And some of the books that she's released include Kiss and Tell, Dragon's Breath, Turning Japanese, I Thought You Hated Me, Losing the Girl, Gravity's Pull, Distant Stars, and Dirty Produce. She's featured in dozens of other books as a contributing writer and artist. And her work's been covered by The Washington Post, Queer Majority, Publishers Weekly, Vice Magazine, Bitch Media, San Francisco Chronicle, and many, many more. 
Mari Naomi's highly anticipated new book, I Thought You Loved Me, is set for publication in February 2023. And she is currently crowdfunding for the printing costs of that book. And I had the wonderful privilege of reading a press copy of that book a few months ago. And it was the most cathartic read I've had in the past year. And I read a lot of books, so that's me saying a lot. This is such a unique book on so many levels. It is like a handcrafted feel that blends letters, blends photographs, other kinds of memorabilia um, that the artist has kept over the years. And it feels like a documentary. It feels like a picture book, feels like a coffee book, feels like a memoir, feels like a journal, feels like a work of literature. It feels like a psychedelic trip. And there is definitely like a psychedelic divine force behind this project that's really fascinating which i'm going to get into more in the actual interview but i really really think you should check out this book because it focuses on the love between two friends what happens when that friendship ends or breaks and how does one cope with the pain how can one get over um, a heartache or heartbreak when it comes to a friendship which is not really explored in our zeitgeist as much as we needed to be explored. And I mentioned this in the interview, but a few years ago, I read her book, um, I Thought You Hated Me, because I was seeking answers shortly after I broke up with my best friend of 20 years. And, you know, friendships end all the time, but when it comes to like a best friendship, that that agony is tremendous. So I, I read that book, Seeking Answers, and I didn't quite find any uh, because that book took a real big turn at a certain point. But um, I definitely found ans some of the answers to the questions that I had at the time in this current book, I Thought You Loved Me. And I have so much gratitude for this book, and I think everybody should read it. So if you're not familiar with Mari Naomi's work, please visit her website, marinaomi.com. Check out her books. They are all marvelous. And please support her crowdfunding campaign by pre-ordering your own copy of this book, which you can own just by supporting this crowdfunding campaign. So if you're somebody who appreciates unique art, uh, art that kind of uh, offers your soul reprieve, then I think this is the book for you. Uh, the website to the crowdfunding campaign is in the uh, description of this podcast. It's also on the website of this podcast, kdramaschool.com. And you can also visit marinaomi.com. But for now, let's talk to Mari Naomi. Awesome. Well, welcome to my kitchen. <laughs> oh, it's a lovely kitchen. Oh, that's because I cleared all the mess to that side. <laughs> ah, mise en scène. Like, if I have to be in a kitchen, at least make it not look completely disgusting. <laughs> it's gorgeous. It looks beautiful. Um, you know, I actually, I actually saw you. Um, it was your twenty twenty January. No. 2029 January it might have been 2020 January um it was at the uh, museum like near Glendale uh and there was like a brunch area it was New Year's Day and there was like a brunch area like a patio and you were there with like friends you were wearing this like amazing glasses and like like a purple outfit. Oh, and, yes. I think that was for someone's birthday. Um, at yeah. the, it yeah. was the Western Museum, right? I think so. It has like a name. I, I just can't, I it's can't like remember It's like the Gene Autry Museum? Yes. There you go. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Yeah. And uh, like, I remember seeing you there and I just couldn't say hi because I was, I was working that day like as a busser. And I was just feeling like shit that day. Aww. And I was just like, oh, I don't feel like saying hi. But, you know, it's like, oh, I interviewed her. I love her work, you know. But I was just like, oh, it's cool to see her here. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember thinking that. Oh. Yeah. 
That was in I, LA a couple years ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was like right before the pandemic. That was yep. one of the few little party things that I'd gone to before everything disappeared. Everything <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I I know like the last time I interviewed you, it was just like via email and it was about your book Dragon's Breath at the time, a uh, book I really love. And um you know, like every time you release a book, I'm like, oh, like she's, you know, she's so prolific and like so, you know, consistent. I love it, you know, and um, like as a as a writer myself, I know how hard it is, especially like for, uh, you know, people who work with independent publishers, you know, with like niche audience. It's so tough, but you always get it out there. And I'm like, you're like my beacon of hope in that oh. regard. Yeah. I can't believe you think I'm consistent. I feel like my art is the most inconsistent out of any artist. But no, you. no, no, no. Your work. I mean, your workflow. I would say is pretty oh. consistent. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I mean, so. it's a little obsessive compulsive. Like I just have to be working all the time. <laughs> I know the feeling. I know the feeling. It's it's just something we do, right? Mm-hmm. In order to just cope and live and get by. <laughs> Right. Even when I'm like, I'm quitting everything, and I'm like, but I'm gonna do this comic on my own. And yes. Then suddenly yes. I have another book. I'm like, dang. Yeah. <laughs> um, back in uh, 2016 or 17, um, I I have it with me right now. But you wrote, you published this book. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I thought, thought you hated you me. Hated me. And yeah, I, my I new book to... is obviously a play off of that because it's another book about friendship. Which exactly. Yeah, although exactly. it's nothing like that book, so I, I was probably a mistake to call it <laughs> something so similar. I mean, it is and it isn't, I would say, because oh. um, it's about friendship. Both books are, are about friendship, female friendships, like girls turning into women, you know, exploring um, boundaries, I guess, with mm-hmm. each other and like, um, you know, harboring feelings while wondering. There's a lot of that throughout, I would say. And um, I actually, I, I bought this book because at the time I was in mourning of a friendship that had died. The friend oh. didn't die. The, the, like, it yeah. was like a, best, like a bestie situation Ugh. from childhood through my 20s. And it just stopped very abruptly. Oh, and wow. like, it was about like two years after that fact. And I was still very much like in it. And I'm sure you could relate, like you talk about it in your new book very much. But like, I mean, why do you think uh, friendships are so agonizing when they break up? They're not supposed to be temporary, I think. I mean, a lot of friendships obviously are. But when you get really close to somebody as a friend, like you just don't think of it in terms of like, well, this is either going to work or it's not. You think, you know, oh, my friend. I, you know, that's why they call it best friends forever, but right. you know, that's right. <laughs> dangerous, but a lot of people drift yeah. apart and stuff. And I think that's pretty normal. But when things end abruptly, it's like, I think it's so more, it, it's way more psychologically damaging than when you get mm-hmm. out of a, a romantic relationship. Cause even, even though those can be so, so heart wrenching and damaging, it's just like, you kind of know that that's a possibility that that could happen. And with, really close friendships that that doesn't even seem like it's an option a lot of the times like I don't my really close friends now like I just can't imagine them ever cutting me out of their lives maybe we'll grow apart and grow back together like that's kind of expected but like just Mm -hmm. ending things like you take it more personally you know yeah yeah I'm sorry about your friendship that's really hard (laughs) It's okay. I mean, as you say, it, it does happen a lot. Sorry to interrupt, but uh, one thing is every time you speak, like oh. there's like a static, you know, like I picked up a book very, very recently and it's written by Dr. Dr. Levine. She's a PhD and she's a psychologist and she wrote a book called Best Friends Forever. And it's basically about how this concept of a best friend is like a cultural construct that we came up with and that no one person can satisfy another person or fulfill that other person completely. Yeah. But then this BFF concept almost puts a pressure on each other to have to do that in a way. It's like, 
in, in some ways the expectation is greater than a marriage. <laughs> like, you know, yeah. so you, go to, you go to your bestie for everything, right? Well, I have several BFFs and I call them all my BFFs because I mean, I just have, it's like my inner circle. And I mean, there's certain yeah. people in your life that you feel like they are going to be there forever. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it, it's kind of ridiculous to rely on one person. I feel like that's just very dangerous. And yes. also in romantic relationships, although I am monogamous, I think expecting your partner, whether platonic or romantic to provide you with everything you need is just very unsettling yeah. <laughs> for both people. <laughs> it is. It's a lot. It's a lot for one person to, you know, handle. Um, but okay, I want to I wanna first maybe then circle back to, uh, because they are connected, like how did you first start writing this book and why? And then we'll transition into the, the love one. I thought you loved me one, but yeah. Sure. Uh, yeah, actually, with I thought you hated me um the the publisher came to me and just said would you like to do a book with us and i said mm. sure and they said it could be a, however long you want it to be whatever you want it to be about which is just like the dream yeah <laughs> and I'm like oh well you know at the time i'm just like people don't write about friends enough like if yes and I just really wanted that to exist in the world. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, well, this is, here's a really kind of complicated friendship that I, you know, that I would love to write about. But like, honestly, I want everyone to write about their friends. I just want more books like that in the world. So it was really, I mean, what they say is put what you want to see out in the world. And this is my example of doing that. And mm -hmm. As far as the the way that I ended up drawing it, um, I because there were such, I guess, low expectations. Like I didn't feel a lot of pressure to do something specific. Mm -hmm. I just had a lot of fun with it, mm -hmm. and I think that um, is the same thing with this new book. Although it wasn't quite as fun, it was a little more painful than fun. Mm -hmm. But um, but I. I was kind of doing it for myself. I didn't expect it to actually get published. I didn't know, um, but I just was having a lot of experimentation with it. Like I was just really enjoying trying new things and seeing how, you know, how, how can I express myself with, you know, with other tools than mm -hmm. comics, which is what I'm used to. Yeah. And I, I just really, like it was, it was both, both books were just really exciting in that, I got to just be who I wanted to be as an artist versus mm -hmm. here, draw something in the style of turning Japanese, which I really enjoyed making, but like yeah. I've already done that. <laughs> right, right. No, like when I when I bought this book, I bought it specifically because I wanted to get like some affirmation or some healing or some answers to why my friendship ended. And like, are there other cases where friendships end like that? And Honestly, I didn't get that satisfaction from this only because it took a turn and it was all about, oh, I thought you hated me, but we actually love each other. And it was like about it was like a celebration of a friendship coming <laughs> together. And then when you when when I saw the announcement for I thought you loved me, I was like. Oh, and I was reading it. I was like, this is the book I needed to read back in 2000. But this is the book I was looking for back in 2017, because it's all about like. I mean, you're so close, but there are questions like there, I, I, there's this one instance where um, Jody ghosts you for a period and you start blaming yourself, you know, like I thought that was really interesting. Like, I think that's a natural tendency. I think that's a very familiar feeling for a lot of people because ghosting, ghosting doesn't just sucks. happen. It's, it ghosting does. Really sucks. And as yeah. someone who wanted to ghost people before, like I just know how hard it is. I really yeah. try not to do that to people, yeah. even though it's so painful to tell people, look, I can't be your friend. Like I've, you know, I've been on both sides of it before. And right. Um, right. just when you know how painful it is to be ghosted, you just never want to put someone else, especially someone that you care about through that. Yeah. Even if you kind of hate them or. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and this was like, you know, before everybody had a cell phone and stuff, like you guys were writing letters and you had landlines and I was like, ghosting was common back then too. You know, maybe it was, it was always even easier. Right. Um, 
uh there's another scene that i remember like i okay so i to give you context i read this book back in the spring mm -hmm. when the first publisher was sending out press kits and stuff and i was i was at uh i was in maryland at the time like waiting to go up on stage for a comedy show and it was just taking so long i was able to read the whole book in that one sitting what? and i was i was having this like moment it was like a very cathartic period for me i was like oh my i was like taking notes so i'm kind of referring to those notes but it's been a few months since i've read the book um but there's this one part where i thought it was so weird and interesting but like the i, I think it was jody's character but she forgets somebody that she spent time with like chris smith like that was me yeah i, I oh, you had forgotten it i completely like oh, I, I kept finding his name in my journals and my notes and yeah, i was so yeah. every time i talked to him like talked about him i would have all these exclamation points and i yeah you know as a 40 something year old like i just had zero recollection of this person i'm like yeah. who is this name this is a very generic name right like I recognize the name, but that could be anybody. Like, is this like at first I'm like, is this a girl or a guy? Who is right. this? Right. Um, and I kind of realize, okay, this is a guy and possibly someone I had a crush on or at least a friend crush on. Like I couldn't yeah. tell. Yeah. And it was just a mystery. And I'm like, even though I was trying to get to the bottom of my relationship with Jody, yeah. and like what that what was really going on when I thought we were best friends, like at the same time, I'm like, who are all these ancillary characters who yeah. I seem to care about at one point and apparently have forgotten? I mean, it's it's a little unsettling to forget people. It is. It is. <laughs> it's like, yeah, no, it's like, oh, it's somebody you were so close to, but they're such a stranger now that you can't even recollect them. And yeah. that's such a major theme in, in this one that I thought you hated me, but also in I thought you loved me, like memory, how memory mm -hmm. is so tricky. and there's like the way that you piece together your memory too it's like you know like a treasure hunt or something like when the way you set out in the book it's very like like an adventurer you know you're like okay but also like with a determination you're like i want to get closure on this relationship this past and let's go in so it's got this like brave courageous you know <laughs> kind of like female adventure kind of thing and i'm like all right let's 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 dive in because like female friendships like friend best friendships are so intense and um so you do that and the way that you archived this relationship over the years with letters and with like pictures and with collages with photographs i was like this is such a unique book and um i also saw what an artist you are like in this way of archiving because artists obsess over archives they collect <laughs> every memorabilia like miranda july does this like i, oh, yeah. I read how she does that virginia wolf used to do this collected everything did couldn't throw things away because they had so much meaning to them so when you were going through the, the the archives and you mentioned that this was painful for you you know like i mean did you have to like kind of prepare yourself to be like i'm gonna dive through these letters and old archives? oh yeah yeah, yeah. I mean, by the time that I was ready to do this, I'd had years to kind of be angry at her and process things and try to process. I mean, when I wrote my um, young adult trilogy that came out um, in 2018, the first one came out, but like I started writing that in 2008 which was, or no, 2009, which is when I found out about Jody and what she'd actually done. Like I, like that's the moment that I'm like, I have to process this artistically. So I, one of the characters in Losing the Girl was based on Jody um, right. and looks like her. And like, I, because I was trying to put myself in her shoes and say like, you know, and figure out like how she could have done the things that she did if she truly loved me right. and, you know, as a writer, like you, you start out with something autobiographical and then the characters just kind of go on their own way. And so uh, eventually it stopped being autobiographical, but I was starting to process it then, but I was just not ready to write about it. So by the time that I was writing about it for this book, 
almost a decade had gone by, you know, a lot of time had gone by and I was like, you know, I got to get over this. Like I got to mm. move on. Like mm. I'm sure she has moved on, you know, mm. and that's, that's always the worst part. It's like, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking about this pretty much every day. Like this has to stop. Cause I know she's even a different person now. Like I can't, you know, you, you can only beat yourself up over something for so long. Um, and yeah, so I was ready to go in, but like, it's hard because I was like, okay, like my, my first instinct when you want to get over something is to push it away and yeah. not dive in, which is what my therapist says you're supposed to do is dive in, but like, it's too painful at first. Yeah, so, it is. so yeah, that was, um, it was rough and it was rough to like see her handwriting again and see all our pictures because I wanted to get over my anger. I wanted to get over my feelings of betrayal and my sadness. And I wanted to stop missing her. And like, yeah, it was, it was really hard. Everything I write that's autobiographical is kind of hard. Like you have to mm -hmm. reopen wounds that you thought were done. And sometimes were done. You're just kind of re-traumatizing yourself sometimes. Mm -hmm. But um, I feel like if I'd gotten therapy, like this book wouldn't have existed. <laughs> <laughs> mm, yeah. but I'm really glad I didn't <laughs> yeah I mean well I mean it's like you're coming to terms with it on your own like in your own way by your own accord you know and I think in in some aspects like that's more empowering and the healing can be even more powerful through that um yeah reopening old wounds for sure um Wait, I just want to go back to you sitting, like waiting for a set and you're like reading this kind of, it's a kind of a rough book. I mean, it's, it's hard to read. Like I, it's not an easy yeah. read. It's not, I, know. I, I feel like I thought you hated me is a very easy, simple, fast read. Like everything's pretty much like what you see is what you get. Yeah. There is a little bit of nuance, but it's like, you don't have to see it if you don't want, where I feel like I thought you loved me is nothing but nuance and like yep. things that you have to look at really carefully and yep, like to yep. figure it out and it's all kind of confusing like it's not an easy fun read like what happened when you got on stage i guess is my question like were you okay <laughs> yeah show was fine i mean comics are intense people you know like we're 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 just sure. like we're fine no matter what and this stage is where we work things out so like that's like freeing for me but the whole time i was reading i had this like knot in my throat like yeah. the whole time and i was just like thank god for this book <laughs> Thank oh, God for this nice. fucking book. And that's why when you were campaigning, like, I mean, you're still campaigning right now to to get the book published. And um, I I'm like, this book has to come out for multiple reasons. But like, you know, this whole like repair idea is so novel. And I don't think people realize it, especially in the United States, where I feel like, um, medicine and the way that they handle relationships are so identical like in western <laughs> medicine it's all about excising removing that that tumor or cancer or whatever it's not it's not about looking at the whole it's about excision yeah. and in our culture of 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 health of mental health there's a lot of cutting out involved in that discourse which i mean there are reasons for it very important reasons for it and i'm not invalidating any of those reasons there are very important reasons boundaries you know all of that is very very important however i think we should be teaching repair methods of repair tools of repair and the benefits of repair just as much because i just read finished reading this book by Stephanie Fu called What My Bones Know. Have you heard of this book? No, I love that title though. I think you would love it. She's also from the Bay Area. Um, mm, she writing writes about she writes about complex PTSD, CPTSD. And uh, she's Malaysian. Well, she's ethnically Chinese, but Malaysian. And she is an emigre. Um, her parents she and her parents immigrated to the Bay Area and she grew up there and now she's like a journalist. She used to be a journalist for This American Life at NPR. Oh, nice. And so she writes about CPTSD. And in that, uh, 
right? Like she talks about estrangement at one point and, you know, she wants to feel like an affirmation, like estrangement from family. Okay, so there's distance now, like, do you feel better? And the, uh, the per this other person who is a professional when it comes to estrangement, like they're very well informed when it comes to estrangement, they were like, no, you don't feel better. You don't feel healed after estrangement. It just stops the bleeding. Yes, right? absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so you in this book, like, I was like, we were all on a journey with you, you know, like, <laughs> you're like, I'm gonna dive into this at, to try and get closure. And then, at it, like, later on in the book, it's like, oh, my God, this big moment of like, <laughs> wait, what? Like, you learn something and then wait, what? contact again and in the in that point it was like you were writing about the affective and physical responses that your body had that your emotions and mind had like you had anxiety about the potential reunion just thinking about the reunion itself all this anxiety heart racing right but it was like a work towards repair can you can you talk about that experience a little bit I mean, that was, it was very surprising that that book turn, took a turn that way, it, especially since at the, at the time that that happened, I didn't, like, I was like, this book isn't going to get done. Like this, this isn't going to happen. I, I have no closure. I'm just working myself into a tizzy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was, uh, I mean, I don't want to give away too much about the yeah. book, but there, yeah. there definitely is, um, I, I do get closure, um, and it's not how I wanted it. Um, but it's, you know, it's good. You know, I don't think that estrangement is necessarily bad. I think you do have to stop the bleeding sometimes. Mm -hmm. I feel like there have been people in my life who I tried and tried and tried to make things work. Yeah. And then after a while, I realized that that was very unhealthy and like, really, yeah. I should just, you know, let it go. Yeah. Um, which is kind of different than this example. It, <laughs> I mean, every, I mean, that's Thing. Like I need to write a million friendship books because every single one of my friendships is, I mean, they're not all complicated, but they're all just very fascinating. I love, you know, just all the interaction I have with people. I just, I'm endlessly fascinated with how people interact and how like yeah. I can get along so well with someone and then someone else who I just adore doesn't get along with that person. Mm -hmm. It's just like, what the hell is wrong with our brains? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All the yeah. time. Happens all the time. No, the, th the thing about this, it was like, there was this cosmic kind of timing, like a miraculous sort of weaving that was taking place. It, it was, was a coincidence it, that if it were fiction, like I just wouldn't believe I'm like, oh, that was easy, an easy out. <laughs> No, this was like cosmic shit. I was like, this is something else. You know, like when somebody, you know, like, again, you had this, uh, like, how do you say, look, almost like a spiritual mindfulness as you were approaching this project. And I think when you set that intention as you're going in, it's like, yeah, okay, you have this spiritual intent, then the spirit is going to be with you kind of thing. Like some cosmic alignment is going to take place when you set that intention, you know? Oh, this boy. is that like California woohoo shit, but like, yeah, I'm into it, whatever, you know? <laughs> and, and, and your book is an example of that. And it's so unique. Yeah. It's pretty weird. <laughs> yeah, that was the hard part about getting it published is it, it's just so unusual. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. And odd. And I mean, I, I say weird and I mean that in a good way because I, I would just, I only like weird books. <laughs> weird books are the best ones because they're the most memorable. I think so. You know, they might all always be good, but like, I like it when people take chances. And unfortunately, that's not how business and industry works. Like people don't want to invest money in something that isn't proven to, you know, to sell. I have yeah. no idea how this is going to do. The, the pre-order campaign to fund the printing of the book is like, I have no idea how, if you know, if it's going to work out. Like, it's just, it's so stressful. Oh, my God. <laughs> I know. But think of it this way. The beginning of this book, right? 
it was like you know you went out with this intention and then the book itself like pr- like is like proof of this fucking craziness the the thing that's <laughs> out of your control but it's like happening it's like oh my gosh you know it was like a You're psychedelic really- book i'm like this is a really psychedelic book i feel like i'm i'm like high on acid right now i'm tripping balls right now an hour before my show i i need to call my shaman right now it was so intense and i, I was like because the even- acid i did in my teenage years paid off in this book <laughs> yeah yeah, this is the culmination. Yeah, yeah, it's like this is what it was all about. <laughs> this is what it was all about. <laughs> all coming together. Because, like, you know, again, like the book itself is so beautiful. It reminds me of like zines, you know, a lot in a lot of ways, like old zines that I've seen. Like they'll use like wallpaper print, you know, or like you know doilies and like add them in there and. What was that process like? How did you put this together? Because it seems so like analog in a lot of ways. Like, was this a lot of scanning? Like, what was the process like when you were putting this together? So I did this book almost entirely on Procreate um, on Mm. the iPad. Uh, But all the photos in it are photos that I took or that were in my yearbook or not yearbook, um, in my photo books. Like pretty much everything was stuff that I was taking at the time to make the book. Um, I've been doing a lot of collage for a long time, and I know that you can't you can't just throw pictures from magazines into a collage and then put and then publish it because you know that's mm. a violation of copyright. Um, mm. So I had that in mind, thinking, well, if I ever want to publish this, I need to come up with um, all my own shit. And uh, mm-hmm. and pretty early on, when I was conceptualizing the book. I'm like, well, I, I really want every image to mean something. And, you know, I don't want to just throw images together because they're pretty. Like, I just, I want something to mean something, even if the reader never understands what that means. Like, I feel like intuitively they might get it. So, for example, the cover of the book is, um, well, it's actually a combination of three different images that I had overlapped, plus, um, plus a drawing that I put in there, plus the mm-hmm. title. But the images that keep recurring are this one, um, this bush that I've since learned is a licorice bush. um, Mm -hmm. And that's the green. And that's um, what represents Jody and Mm -hmm. um, roses, which represent my love for Jody. And Mm -hmm. this, I think they're lilacs or um, they're the really smelly purple flowers Mm -hmm. um, that kind of hang. They look like little cones. Uh, I can't remember what they're called, but they're... Are um, they in clusters? Maybe hydrangea. Or, I don't oh, know. They're, yeah. They're, they're hydrangea. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so I took a, a bunch of pictures of those, and then I cut them out, basically, but like in, in uh, on the computer, not with my hands, and, and, and just like overlap them. So it turned into like a background. Um, and that represented my memory, um, because mm. those particular flowers, every time I smell them, like it, it just like my memory, some kind of childhood thing comes up. Mm. So that's what that represented. And, and going forward, I, I created more and more uh, visual metaphors as I went along, but those are the three main ones. Um, and I started from there and um, yeah, I don't, it, was, it was very just, there was, all, I was just everywhere I went for years, I was just taking pictures of everything. I'm like, oh, that's a good texture. Oh, that's a good texture. Oh, that's very pretty. Oh, that could, you know, at one point I'm talking about living in San Francisco. I'm like, okay, I either have to find a good San Francisco shot or that I took or I have to go there. So I did a lot of um, recon missions where I'm just like, okay, I need a picture of the bridge. I need a picture of, of Knob Hill where I lived. And then, yeah. and then I'll kind of overlap that. Um, yeah, yeah. No, this is a lot. You're, you're being like a documentarian when you were making this book. Yeah, yeah, I was, I was trying. Um, <laughs> yeah, but I, didn't, you know, I, at the same time, like I'm talking about a lot of other people, but I also didn't want, and this is, this is a whole memoir thing. Like I didn't want to impinge on anyone's privacy, um, which is very difficult when yes. you're writing about yourself in relation to other people. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was taking a lot of care to not you know, step on anybody. Um, there's a lot yeah. of personal information about other people here. Um, 
Jody gave me her complete consent and as you read like to to mm -hmm. publish everything and there's a lot of published a, a lot of uh, really personal information about her in there yeah. um but which I feel a little weird about but you know it's part of the again, book again that's that's cosmic trust man <laughs> that's cosmic <laughs> trust Jody has cosmic trust you I know I hope she doesn't regret it I mean I hope she's cool with it like down the line like that's my fear because people do change their mind and then you just have to deal with that but yeah but we got to be present you know we gotta yeah. be present all we know is the now you know like just like you I knew the now person. I do not live in the moment. <laughs> oh, no, no. Just like you knew in the now when you were diving into the book and then in the now when this repair was happening and then now in the now when you're doing this campaign to get the book out. It's like, that's all we have is the now, you know? And, and as I'm you working say, on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. As you say, like, you know, our memory is unreliable, but, um, like our our anxiety about the future is just as unreliable yeah see yeah it's like time is a funny thing um i'm always like stepping into the future but dragging the present like the past along with because because i'm you know a memoirist i'm always like thinking how can i use the past to pivot to the future <laughs> yes yes because that's just what we know. We we base everything on our experiences and and we want to be safe. Like we want to be protecting of ourselves, right? And um, yeah. that's a loving thing. That's a loving thing that you do for yourself. And I think that's awesome. And um, yeah, this book, holy shit. <laughs> I, I want it to be out so badly. It will, it will. Did uh, it help you like with your, like, re like with your own friendship, like, like yeah. thoughts like mm -hmm. what like how did that how did that affect you because like I feel like that's that's my curiosity I, I I've talked to a number of people who've read it who yeah I mean I feel like everyone has had a friend leave mm -hmm. them in a mm -hmm. weird way before and Absolutely. and those and I'm getting a lot of people saying oh my god like I needed to read about something like this to yes. process my own stuff and 100%. I mean a hundred percent I wish no. I had to read when I was processing <laughs> my stuff like it's yes like, yeah i wanted to help but i you know i'm wondering if it actually does or if it's like yeah yes yes it okay. does <laughs> like, like you you you're gifting this to your childhood self the one that was um, like i wish there was a book like this you know and you're gifting this to like all the the people like their younger selves when they've experienced a fallout with a best friend you know this intense commitment you know it's like and as you i thought you put it so perfectly you're like friendships are supposed to last forever you know supposed to last forever it's an expectation and yeah. expectation sets us up for disappointment it's just how Absolutely. it goes yeah <laughs> and and uh i i wrote i wrote a novel like years ago but i didn't write fiction for like a decade like i couldn't i thought i was over it and then um last year i finished uh I finished up my graduate degree and um i wrote a second novel like really fast like a wow. draft it came out in like a few months time just super fast and in that novel i do um traverse my ex my my broken relationship with my ex-best friend but and this is something i want to ask you like when you're diving into something like this, you know, you're also looking at your own personal mistakes that you've made in this relationship, right? I feel like that's perhaps the hardest. It's easy actually to point out the shit that she's done. It's like this bitch did this, and this, and this. <laughs> but as you're doing that, it's hard to point out the loving moments that you've had with her. It's like, she was the best because of this and this and this. Also, I've fallen short when I've done this and this and this. Like, how were you able to do that part? I mean, that's the thing. Like after I got a little knowledge about why she ghosted me, from that point on, like my brain immediately went into demonizing mode where like, I just, I pretty much forgot everything I loved about her. Um, yeah, and yeah. I knew that I technically knew that we were really close friends for a long time. And mm -hmm. I had a couple of memories, but like, 
I'm like, that doesn't make a friendship. Like what? And so that's mm. the whole point of the book was to try to remember, like, why were we friends? Like, right. why did I love her? Um, and also to find, figure out, like, did, did she actually love me? Like I was, you know, to the best of my abilities, you know, given all this stuff. And I mean, end of the day, yes, but it's complicated. <laughs> we loved each other very much and, and, but it was complicated. And I, um, just like I was demonizing her after, you know, I, I found more information. Like when we were friends, I was doing the opposite. I was putting her on a pedestal. And so I didn't see all these things that were there. And, mm -hmm. and yeah, it was, I mean, it was very eye opening, but also like, I think I was just making myself crazy with it because there's only so much you can figure out when you have the past to work with. I mean, there's, yeah only so much you can do because every time you relive the past you're creating a different version of it and it's like well what actually happened like what like in reality we just hung out a lot and you know we were there for each other I mean the present is very boring because <laughs> it's not you can't fit the present into a narrative like as a yeah. as a storyteller like we want we want things to mean something. We want like a larger story, but like we're, when you're living in the present, there's no larger story. It's just what's mm -hmm. happening. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A hundred percent. Um, I mean, do you think like, do you think you were able to come to some kind of healing first and able to recollect those like more loving moments and tender moments about her and then come to, and then start writing this book or was that starting to happen as you were working on this like like because i feel like you know you're you're mentioning something important like the demonizing part that's because you're still angry which mm -hmm. means you're in pain and then if you're able to kind of see the love and recollect the love it's like okay you're kind of sprouting out from that layer and entering the next phase which is like the potential of forgiveness or seeing something from a like a wholer perspective was that happening as you were working on this or, or did it happen before you started diving in it was kind of the point of working on it um i see when, it, when i started i don't think i was healed and it too much time had passed for me to feel like this was logical or justified which i mean emotions yeah. aren't logical or justified but i was like i'm ready to be over this i'm ready to move on i'm ready to Got let it. go of her but also i think to, to let go i need to really examine what happened and i need to remember the love to let go of it um right you know, but so, i think it was okay. not really working out as well as as uh i think i think in a book yeah. i even said like i i was trying to exercise the demon but it yeah. um but it kind of ended up ended up overtaking me um, yeah 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 it was, there was uh, a, a part in the book where you were like i feel lost like what was this all about like yeah um you know and <laughs> I, I i think i think uh that, yeah yeah that, i thought that was such an interesting part because it's like that's sort of the the wall i was hitting with the novel is like i I, w I wasn't able to include a lot of the loving stuff in there, to be mm. quite frank. It was more about just, it was very indulgent in the pain and stuff. And that's how I know that the book is not finished, nowhere near completion, because it, you can't do that. Come on, you have to think about the reader. But um, <laughs> when, when, like, when we're kind of still in that grief mode, and it, it's like we're in the spiral like we're kind of you know caught in the in the turmoil and it's like well when's this gonna stop when am i gonna get out and again like that was the freaky thing like this cosmic occurrence that took place you yeah know, while you were in the midst of writing this <laughs> it did it did feel like a, a just a big brain spiral yeah i was not i mean but i was, I was definitely learning things about myself i could it's been a lot enough time. Like I finished the book in 2018 and then we had a pandemic. And so I feel like I've had enough time to kind of look back and see, well, that, that was helpful, but I didn't see it at the time. Um, but it was helpful that I was facing my emotions. And even if the cosmic thing hadn't happened, like, I think, hmm. I think the, I think the book would have ended somehow. <laughs> yeah. It might not as it might not have been as interesting, <laughs> but uh, but I think it would have ended. I think I would have 
gotten the closure eventually, but not quite as quickly. I think um, mm. it might have been another few years. Mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. it was, but like it, it's so much time. Like that, I'm almost fifty, and this relationship happened like in my teens and twenties. It's like, oh my god, come on, like get over this. And I've had other relationships, like friendships, that haven't worked out and those didn't affect me in the same way it was um yeah it was it was pretty nuts <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah no but maybe I'll write about those too I don't know <laughs> uh, this I, I feel like this this is like a specific chapter in your whole yeah. kind of life journey you know definitely it's like, the cosmos is like yeah man it's this one <laughs> it's like <laughs> you know you have family and then you have this you know you have romance but this is a big one like fucking decades man you know i feel like that, like that was again like i just really want to put more things about friendships out in the world and i want to encourage other people to like i know that a lot of the the risks i've taken with with my art just or vulnerability risks or because I saw other people taking risks and I felt like, Oh, I could do that. Like mm -hmm. I, you know, I suddenly have permission to take risks and I want to give that permission to other people to take those risks and, you know, share with the world. Like I just, I want to put more things out there that I want to read because I'm selfish and I want to read good books. Yeah. I think that's a great reason, you know, like there are two <laughs> things that are very like uh, helpful for me right now that you're saying, like first, when you mentioned the hydrangeas and how it had this like Proustian effect, you know, it's like <laughs> Proust and the Madeleine is like such a thing in literature. Right. But it's like, no, like you mentioned scent and mm -hmm. like the olfactory is right below our brain. And that's why when we smell things, it just memory is triggered with such intensity, you know, and it's like, you know, your book has this symbolism in there and how scent is something you can't avoid, man. Like taste, you could avoid eating that shit. But scent, <laughs> it, like it just penetrates you. It's an assault to your senses. It just like <laughs> enters you whether you want it to or not. And that's how memory works too. Like flashbacks yeah. just invade you like whether you feel like it or not man it's like oh today you're gonna deal with this while you're driving and you're stuck in traffic why don't you entertain this it sucks <laughs> and and that's the, the the this complexity that you're dealing with in your book is like you know friendships sometimes like as loving as it can be can sometimes suck so fucking badly you know yeah. but that is what it is and you know, and you put together this really, really uh, unique book. You also mentioned permission, right? And like permission, I studied literature in college and they always say like, oh, the modernists and postmodernists gave one another permission for the next generation. And I was like, well, they're all like a bunch of like white dudes, you know, who went to Columbia University. Like what kind <laughs> of permission Grant is? I mean, that's that's so condescending, but like, <laughs> I love the way you say it. It's like you're talking about permission to really allow yourself to be okay as a misfit, you know, mm -hmm. it, that, I think that's what you're saying. And like, I see it in like everything that you do, you know, like your fashion, like, I love your fashion photos and like oh, the glasses you. you wear, you know, the <laughs> lipsticks, you know, and this book, like, again, it's so unique and it's so personal and the little artifacts and the layering that you have, right? Like the way that memory is also layered, like it's it's so beautiful. And oh, I yeah. wish it were scratch and sniff. Like I, if, if I could wish one more thing about this book, other than that it, it reaches its funding goal and gets printed, like I wish it were scratch and sniff. You could smell the roses, you could smell the fear. Amazing. Someday. <laughs> Might not be too late. You know, you can maybe make stickers, you know, scratch and stiff snick stickers as merch Ooh. for this. Who knows? Yeah, yeah. But that's an amazing idea. <laughs> Do it. <laughs> Do it. Yeah, I definitely with the hydrangeas like or whatever they're called. They're um Yeah. I did like the the what do you call it? Procreate that I was using. The program lets you um really kind of make things ghostly like you could take a layer and uh, just slim it down and so you could just see a faint outline so I, I kind of did that with with those flowers like when I started to like 
when the memory started coming back, like I would, I would like throw a flower in or maybe like a flower that was kind of in like mostly translucent. Like I, yeah. I had so much fun with it. Like it's, it's so pretentious. I can't even get over it. Oh, <laughs> I love it. I love pretentious stuff. I love, I'm all about it. Do it. Yes. You know, um, you know, the whole like flowers as ghostly thing, like uh, that, that film adaptation, you seen it charlie kaufman yeah a long time ago but they have an orchid called the ghost you know and it's like flowers and like ghosts and spirits it's like it's like a whole thing so yeah i love pretense do it you know it's so funny like we get we get we beat ourselves up the most about like pretense or cheesiness you know and it's like what's wrong with either of the things people love cheese and oh, yeah. people love pretentious shit like oh, hell yeah. so I why do it. we gotta feel shame about it man <laughs> embrace the people it who don't are the people who don't get it and i think that's i mean i love performance art i love all sorts of modern art i love modern dance and yeah if you're looking at it from a like a perspective where you're just like not in the mood for it or mm -hmm. you don't understand it then it looks kind of ridiculous mm -hmm. um but like once <laughs> like if you get it it's so much more interesting than a, a drawing of a stupid like i don't know like a still life or whatever which you know it's lovely it's fine yeah, yeah. but like is it going to change your whole outlook on life no like yoko ono did that to me where i'm like wow that's so silly and then one day it just snapped i'm like oh my god she's brilliant like she's she's just brilliant yeah and it changed how i made art it made it changed how i viewed art yeah. um you know and, and countless other artists have done that for me but i specifically yoko ono like i have yeah. it going to her San Francisco Modern Art Museum uh, yeah. exhibit, like, I think it was like 2002 or something. It just changed everything for me. I'm like, oh, you could do it like that. Like, it doesn't have to be a sculpture yes. or a painting. You could do other things. And that is just as art as other things, you know, these other things we consider art. Like, exactly. yeah, your, your six-year-old can put a message in a bottle or whatever. But, like, are they coming up with this concert concept? No. Like, yeah yeah so so brilliant like I, I don't know art's just yeah i love art yeah yeah <laughs> yeah it's so it's so freeing it gives our soul a little bit of space to just be like feel a little freedom and i think mm -hmm. that's i think that's what's wonderful about it and i think that's really what's great about your book because it's it's doing two major things one is it's offering this a uh, cathartic space for people to kind of deal with their own friendships, you know, go through a mourning process or just like recollect or find closure, find healing or or give themselves space to feel anger or feel frustration and sadness, you know. Um, and the other thing is like as the the piece itself, the artifact of the book itself, it's so unique, you know. It's like it's almost like a coffee table book, but it's not. It's like a memoir, you know. It's a graphic novel, but it's like, is it? It's also a documentary film, is it? It's like, you know, it's also it's also psychedelics. Like, is it? Like, you're afraid of drugs? Read this book, you know, because you mentioned like it's it's altering perspective. Like that's what this book does, you know. That's what it is. So, yeah, all the all the best to you in this book. Like, and I. I have the trust in this cosmic thing that's attached to this book. I do. I think <laughs> it will it will come out. It somehow some it's going to get out and it must and it's I think it's definitely a gift to many many people. So thank I'm you gonna, for writing I'm gonna it. I'm going to push it out. I'm going to it's been a painful birth so far. Like I this is my second publishing publisher who's had yes. it like I've gone through a lot so far it was really yeah. hard to get here but it's like my problem child and I'm gonna have it I know <laughs> I know no this problem child is gonna it's gonna be the one that like blows everybody out of the water it's like wait her she went <laughs> where she was a mess man it's like no no she was a genius just misunderstood <laughs> just misunderstood in the wrong environment she's genius yeah 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 <laughs> i'm excited you're for your so book kind. you're very yeah kind. Thank you. no no really um so yeah uh should we plug your your campaign and anything else you want to plug um i want to plug art and yoko ono 
If you are a listener who has not fallen in love with Yoko Ono yet, I I, I beg you to look a little closer and yeah. um, not forget about the Beatles. They're, who, who cares about the Beatles? I mean, I love yeah. the Beatles, but like, who cares? Yeah, yeah. Like, that's, that's a separate thing. Who cares about what culture has been saying about Asian women and specifically Yoko Ono? Just like, forget all of that and just look at the art and forget everything and just like let it absorb you that's who i want to plug yeah um, yeah but yeah she's, you want to she's help... done so much yeah she's, she is i mean her she's amazing and she's yeah. still so hot and amazing like just in, in every sense of the word just amazing i went i saw her at the fox theater in oakland playing with uh her son and the whole time like she was so powerful and she was just all over that stage and heels the whole time. And like oh. behind them playing was a giant yeah. um, theater screen. Of just, and it was just like a close up of a black and white, presumably her vulva with like flies <laughs> landing on it. And I'm oh like, oh my God. This is the most wonderful thing I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. It was so uncomfortable in a in a glorious way. Um, but yeah, whoever wants to help um like help fund the book by pre-ordering, we're giving out perks. Um, you could just go to my website and you'll see a link to help help uh just pre-order the book or on my Twitter. It's just my name, Mari Naomi. I have a TikTok and Instagram and all that stuff too, but eh. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much for speaking with me. Thank you. Thank you for reading my book and, and telling me your thoughts about it. That's like, that's all I, I or any author really wants out of it is just to hear people say that they like it. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> or why they don't like it. I'm, I'm also interested in that, but less so. 